like we rightly said, you are currently on recording, and um, we're going to, um, like I said to you guys, we have um, seven things that we'll be learning throughout the, you know, the the period of this training. One of them is going to be CopTI Plus, which is what we're going to be starting with today. I know some of you have received the test books and you're like, man, Sam, these books are big. Now, one thing I want you to know is that each of those books, as big as it is, I'm going to finish it in one month for you guys. OK, I'm going to leave no stone unturned and you're going to understand what exactly is in each of those test books that I've sent to you. Now, I'm not using the textbook. It's not required for this training. But I decide to share the textbook with you so that you guys can make a reference at any point in time when there's anything for you to do. After the Copter A+, we're going to be going into the network class where we'll be learning, you know, the basics about networking, how computers communicate with one another, what are the components, what is required to be able to work within, you know, the network field. After that, we're going to be going into Windows 10 for us to understand how we can manage Windows 10 operating system. I know that majority of us have experience, you know, probably installing Windows 10 when it crashes and you could just put one or thing to, together. But in this training, you will be understanding in detail what is required for you to install in Windows 10, what is required for you to configure in Windows 10, and what exactly is the skill you'll be bringing on board to be able to maintain any Windows 10 within a business organization. We'll be looking at um, customization as well. Then after that, we'll be looking at Windows Server Operating System. Some of you might have heard about it before, but this time around, you'll be working with it in detail. You will understand what it takes you know what it means and you understand how you can configure it. Now, one thing I want you guys to have at the back of your mind that this is a practical oriented class. Don't think because you're, you're, you're watching remotely, I'm going to be sending you credentials later today that you're going to be using to log into our infrastructure here at Crossword and you'll be able to carry out your assignment and um, you can log in at any point in time when you feel like carrying out, you know, doing any other practical, you can log in into it and do whatever you want to do. OK, I'm going to set the rules when I'm sending you the email for you to understand what and what is going to be required. After Windows Server, we're going to be doing, along with Windows Server, we're going to be dealing with what we call Active Directory, where you manage objects within, um, within a, um, a container. When I mean objects, I mean users account, I mean um, computers itself. We're going to be, after that, we're going to be working on um, SCCM, which is called uh, a System Center Configuration Manager, which is one of the alt kicker outside RAM now. With um, the basic, you'll be learning about it. The minimum payroll you're going to get for it is $35 an hour. You know it very well, you get for the $5 an hour. It's also part of the senior infrastructure class where you will learn the infrastructure side of SSC game where you'll be able to build it. After that, we're going to be looking like partial scripting. And um, like I said, by two months or two months and a half, I'll start working on your resume. You can start looking for a job. And um, I bet it's with you, by that time, you already have the skills for you to be able to do a level one or level two job, and it's going to be good. So uh, I'm going to be moving on with each of those slides. This is what we're going to be doing, part of what we're going to be doing today. We've covered the introductory part, which is not recorded, um, you know, but now we'll be looking at what exactly we're going to be focusing on. First of all, we want to, we're going to be looking at what exactly do we regard as CopTIA A+. You know, you're going to be seeing it outside. Yeah, people talk about it. What exactly does it mean? OK, then we'll be looking at um, what are the key components of things that you need to know when you're talking about CopTI A+. OK, CopTI A+, is divided into two sections. We have the, the core aspect, core one and core two. One has to do with hardware, and the other one has to do with software. So in this line, you will understand every component within a computer. You will know what it does. Then you'll be looking at the software aspect, so now you can configure your first operating system or install your first operating system. Then after this, we'll be looking at what kind of skills it's expected of you to acquire in A plus class. I'm not saying skills expected for you to acquire throughout the entire of this program. I'm saying skill that you should have at the end of A plus that you're going to be doing. Then I'm going to show you what kind of job you can do with A plus. And the reason why I said that within the next two months, you can start applying for a job. We're going to be looking at companies that come together to form what we regard to as A plus. Then um, we're going to be looking at what are the domains. I mean, what when we talked about core one, core two, what is combined together to form core one? What is combined together to have core two? So I'm going to be showing you guys. Then, like I said, I'm going to be telling you what exactly we meant by CopTIA A+. 
then why exactly do you need to get a CUPTI plus, okay? And, and um, how do you pass this exam? So these are part of the things which I'm going to I'm going to be discussing. OK, so before we go down, you know, one of the things I mentioned to you guys is what makes up of um, CUPTIA A+. Plus. But before we go into that, I'm going to be telling you what the word CUPTIA A+, plus mean. OK, now the COMP that you see there on the screen means computer. So anytime you see COMP, literally it means computer. Then you would see the word T. T means technology. The A there means associ association. And the A plus is just a certification that you do to become certified. So that is what they combine together to form the word CUPTIA A plus. So when anybody asks you, what is the meaning of CUPTIA A plus? You should know there is a combination of words attached together. The COMP means computer. The T means technology. The I means industry. The A stands for association. And the A plus is the certification that you get, you know, when this is done. Now, I talked about, you know, um, if you look at it well, why should you get, you know, why get A plus um, certified? Why exactly do you need to be certified? Now, majority of the organizations, when you work, you want to work as L1 and L2, always want someone that is certified. It's not that you cannot work without, you know, um, when you don't have this certificate, but it is all a plus for you, for you to have it. And um, the whole essence is that CUPTIA plus is um, a kind of an entry level certification for PC um, service technician for you to be able to, you know, maintain a computer, troubleshoot a computer, resolve a computer. You know, it is expected that you should have this certificate. It makes you, it differentiates you from every other person that says that they work on the computer. Now, the exam is designed to certify the competence of um, entry level computer PC, you know, for people that are going to be working as a professional in installing, maintaining, customizing, and um, operating a personal computer. OK, that's one. Number two is that for you to make more money, you can get a certificate. It differentiates you, like I said, from people that don't have. Now, number three is that um, companies require it. They want you to have it. A lot of people lie in their resume and they put it that they have it just to get a job because most of the time organizations, especially in Canada, don't ask you to provide a copy of your certificate. If you put it there, they just want to hear you speak. That is the word in, in, in Canada, you know, and, um, you know, everything outside Canada, probably in Nigeria, when you say you have XYZ certificate, they want to see it. But Canada believes in the words of mouth. And what I mean words of mouth is how exactly you can explain the skills that you say you have, how you can explain, you know, how you can work effectively within the domain if they employ you, right? And, um, you know, when you have the certificate as well, it gives you that feel of your skill and it allows you to be able to create a career path. Either later in the future, you want to be a cybersecurity person or you want to be a system administration person or you want to go into infrastructure. Now, any field you decide to go after this program, you must have this foundation. You must understand. And I talked to a lot of people and they said, oh, I want to be a cybersecurity specialist and X, Y, Z. And I say, there's nothing bad in you becoming a cybersecurity or a business analyst or whatever it is. One thing that matters, as a cybersecurity person, how do you understand the terrain that you want to work? It's like a medical doctor, right? You say you're a medical doctor into maybe general, you know, medicine. You don't even understand, you know, the body. You don't understand how you can differentiate, you know, what veins is the atrix and everything. It's just like an accountant. OK, that you say, oh, I want to become an accountant or I'm an accountant and you don't even understand the trading profit and lost account. You don't understand the ledger. OK, it's just like a pharmacy that you don't understand the combinations when it comes to the formulation of drugs for you to be able to know based on people's body and reaction to medic um, to 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 me um, to um, uh, to drugs, right, um, to medications for you to know what and what we work with them based on test results. And you cannot even, you know, being able to explain that. It's just like when you work in a factory or you work in an operational environment where items are being lifted from one place to the other, and you don't even understand the safety to be able to work effectively or for you to be able to understand the kg of each particular item and see what your body can be to pick at or carry at any point in time. Now, lack of professionalism, lack of skills that is required for a job can cause a damage not just to you, but also at the expense of the organization that you want to work with. Now, 
having a plus certificate is not a guarantee for you to have a job. But one thing I can assure you is that when you have it, it takes you to the doorstep of the interview, meaning that if thousands apply for a particular job role, one of the criteria for them to select people they will call for interview before they even know if you know computer or not, it's, oh, this person is certified. Let me bring them. It's just like a chartered accountant. If you're not chartered, you're an accountant, but you're not chartered. There's a certain, a certain level you cannot get to in your organization. You might be a dentist, and um, when you're not certified according to Canada, Canada regulation, you won't be able to work, right, even though you understand it. They might allow you to work in organizations where activities like this go on. You can just work in as a support staff, but not at, as a core person, right? And um, it, same thing is applicable to every um, same thing is applicable to every every discipline, not just computer. Okay, then uh, you will want to ask yourself, why is A plus uh, is A plus worth it? Okay, let me phrase it like that. Okay, when it comes to what you put in in verse with what you get out. Okay, CompTIA plus certification is um, most definitely worth it, and the reason is this: ask people. Um, who owns it? We have over 1.2 million of people in the world that have um, CompTIA A+, you know, certification that is issued up to date. Okay, ask them, and they will tell you the whole lessons why it is important for you to have this knowledge, which is the basics in computer. Okay? Then the next thing is this. How do you pass the exam? Okay, for this exam, what you need to do is, you after your skills, you can you, you register the exam. You know, with pandemic, people tend to do the exam online, where you're going to have an online proctor. You're going to have a proctor that is going to watch over the entire section where, you know, um, the exam is going to take place. You're going to take it in a room where nobody goes in, nobody goes out. But after pandemic or in some countries where pandemic, it, it's not really, you know, there is no there is no closure to offices and all. You can go to a center. Some of the centers are called VU centers or prometic centers where you'll be able to register and you'll be able to you'll be able to do your exam. OK, um, the exam is actually based on, you know, the traditional way and multiple choice that which questions are being asked. So meaning that in some instances, you just speak A or B is always objective. A or B or multiple answers is going to be available and for you to be able to do that. Now, we want to go into what you'll be learning, you know, for CopTIA A+. I'm not saying what you'll be learning throughout the entire program, but what you're going to be learning in the next one month. Now, we're going to be starting with the CopTIA, um, the core one, which the exam code is always 20-1001, and you're going to be learning five domains. Um, one of them is called mobile devices. You'll be understanding the architectures, how mobile devices work, how you can troubleshoot, you know, mobile devices. We're going to be looking at network technologies, you know, relating to, you know, um, CopTIA Plus. Then we'll be talking about different, um, we're talking about hardware, which are different parts of the computer, where you'll be identifying what a RAM is, what a motherboard is, what a coprocessor is. You'll be understanding expansion bus, which is sometimes referred to as the PCI. You'll be understanding things like um, the North Bridge, the South Bridge. You'll be understanding different kind of protect, uh, processors and architecture. You'll be understanding hard, um, hard drives, floppy drives, um, CD-ROM. You'll be able to identify all these things and how it comes together you know, to become a computer. We'll be looking at virtualization and cloud computing. You know, the world now has moved from the traditional way where you use your computer to a virtualized environment where you don't need to occupy the entire space with computers or servers. You can have a single server and you can have every other servers embedded in a virtualized environment. OK, then we'll be looking at cloud computing because without a virtualization, cloud computing cannot come into existence. And you will be understanding that in the course of the program. Then we'll be looking at the, the common basic troubleshooting. You know, I, I was interviewing some set of people lately, and, um, you know, I asked them a very simple question. You know, they're high tech people. And, you know, I said, can you tell me, I know you work in XYZ in your past experience and all, and currently what you're doing now. Can you tell me the basic troubleshooting skills? And, um, you know, some of them could not articulate themselves to be able to tell me. And you know what? Organizations have problem with that when they know that you don't understand the principles, the basic principles of troubleshooting, because you can cause them more harm than good, because you lack the expertise to be able to do all this. So we'll be looking at how exactly can you troubleshoot? What are the procedures? Once you follow the procedures, you can get any job when they ask you stuff like that, and you'll be able to troubleshoot problems to be able to provide a profound solution at any point in time.
Okay, we'll be looking at um, the, the, the core two, which is called um, the 20 um, 1000, 20 1002. And um, there are three things that you'll be learning here. You'll be looking at um, installing and configuring operating system, and this is going to be Windows 10. We're going to be looking at um, expanding um, um, expanded um, security. You know, how exactly can you extend you know, security into your business, into your Windows 10? or into a business environment? What are the mechanisms? What exactly do you need to know about cyber, cyber attack? What are the things you need to know when it comes to something like um, spoofing, when it comes to phishing, when it comes to um, ear um, dropping, and you know different kind of mechanisms when it comes to um, how to protect your environment you know, from, um, from hackers or crackers you know, for you to be able to protect your domain. Then we'll be looking at how can you troubleshoot a software? And what are the operational procedures that you carry in organizations? You know, uh, in every corporate organization, there are procedures that needs to be followed when you need to troubleshoot at any point in time. Meaning that when there is a problem, people call just the same way you call Rogers, you call Bell or whatever internet service you're using. And you say, hey, um, my internet is not working. It stopped working for some time or my internet is slow. Now, you will realize that what always happens is that the person you're talking to will try to get your name, we try to get your location in some instance, and we ask you for you know, what you've been experiencing when it started. Now, that part that that person is doing is what we call the ticketing aspect of the business. So that's, it, it, it's part of the operational procedure. So they're going to, what they're going to do is that they're going to create a ticket on your behalf. Sometimes the person talking to you, they always regard to as what we call the L1, you know? where they're going to listen to you and ask you for all the questions. If it's something they can run you through in terms of resolution, they will do it. But when they cannot do it, they're going to create that ticket. They're going to um, push it in. So they're going to assign it to someone in L2, someone above them, to be able to resolve it. Now, if they resolve the ticket for you as well, they're going to create that ticket and close it. Now, the whole essence of all the ticketing aspect is for the organization to understand where their skill gaps, where their challenges, within the organization and give this them a better performance analysis of how the um, IT environment within the organization has been able to standardize or to be able to make a control to happen within the organization. So if they introduce new solutions or new things happening, they can able to know when there are problems. So it allows you to be able to gather all your ticketing and to be able to take a decision aspect of it. And for um, some of you that says you work at, um, okay, I can't remember, where Yinka works, and um, all other calls. So um, you will realize, I don't know really know how you guys work, but I know definitely there will be a form of ticketing. And same as every other person in the medical field, there's going to be something like ticketing. And you will understand what I'm saying, you know, when it comes to that, when people create a ticket. Sometimes ticket don't come by, by call. It comes by email. People will create an escalation and say, hey, I'm having XYZ challenge with my account. Now, what is happening at that level is the, what we call as first level escalation. I have a problem. I call the contact center or I send them an email or I chat them up. That is the first level. The person you're talking, if, if the person cannot resolve that problem, is going to tell you that, hold on, I need to transfer you to our technical team. Okay? That aspect is when it goes to the L2. The L2 now will now look at that ticket and see if they can resolve it. If they cannot resolve it, they're going to push it to L3 for them to be able to look at it and resolve. And when it's resolved, they put a comment on what and what was done. And when it is resolved, they're going to close the ticket. So it is the duty of the L1 to get back to the customer. And when I mean customer, it can be an outside person. It can be someone within your organization and say, hey, the problem is resolved. Can you confirm that it's truly resolved? When the customer confirmed, then you can close the ticket. So we're going to be looking at those procedures and how exactly you can explain what happened to that user and, um, you know, for them not to make such mistakes that if it comes from them. So we're going to be looking at all that, you know, doing A+. Plus, and you'll be having a better appreciation of what we're what, what you're working on. Like I said, the next screen you see important um, skill area. So meaning that you're going to be having experience when it comes to hardware, when it comes to operating systems, when it comes to how you can troubleshoot networking. You know, just all I just mentioned now in the domain. So these are the skills that you're going to be having at the end of your A plus, not at the end of your entire program. Just A plus. You'll be able to do all this comfortably yourself. Okay, once you finish your A+, plus, these are the kind of jobs you can get. Even without starting your network plus, you can get jobs relating to service decks. As a service desk analyst, you can get jobs relating to app decks, what I mentioned the other time. So all these 
are more of level one and some of them have level one, level two activities. So you can apply for a job relating to technical support special as a technical support specialist. You can apply for jobs relating to, you know, field service technician. Um, you know, everything you see there, that's like um, 10 jobs that you can apply for at the end of your A+. Plus. Okay, but I will tell you, just hold on. Don't apply yet. Wait until we finish the network class so you can have a better appreciation and you can have a better understanding to be able to withstand any interview relating to that area. So because every interview relating to L1, L2 always fall in between, you know, things relating to Coptia Plus and things relating to Coptia Net Plus and um, Windows 10. So you are be sure that you do a lot of practical relating to Windows 10 doing this Coptia Plus. So you can have a balance and um, you can be able to have a swift in career as quick as possible. OK. Then, uh, you know, I make mention that there are some certain bodies that come together and think, say, hey, there is a need for us to be able to identify people with the right skills in the market that understand how to be able to maintain infrastructures, how to be able to support infrastructure. And if you look at it weirdly, and you will look at some certain things a little bit different. You're like, what is Blue Cross Blue Shield doing on this list? And uh, for people in the medical line, you will understand that Blue Cross Blue Shield is medical. And you will also see that Nissan is a car, uh, is a car company. And, um, you know, Rico is a um, company that produces printer. Intel, that's Microsoft. And you have Dell and HP. Now, the reason why you see Blue Cross Blue Shield there is that operational, um, there's always what we call safety and professionalism in IT meaning that you need to ensure that you follow the safety precaution so you don't hurt yourself. And you need to know what and what you need to, to do to ensure that you have a safe, a safe and um, a sound environment where operational activities can be able to be carried out. Then, you know, hardware, you look at printers and all. For people within L1, L2 to be able to work in organizations, you need to be able to be able to support when there are printer problems. You need to be able to understand how to configure a printer because every organization, when it comes to output devices, uses printer, right? You need to understand. And, you know, HP, we all know, most of us might not know much about it, but at least you're seeing laptops that do with HP. And um, for Intel, you might just, you might have held it, you might have seen it somewhere, but that is Microsoft, you know, in charge of a lot of things, both hardware in terms of processor and in terms of um, in terms of operating systems as well. So that's Intel. Now we already talked about this. What do you need? You know, what do you need to know about this A plus? And this is what we're covering today. We're covering four things. We're going to be doing safety and professionalism. We're going to be looking at the physical computer, the visible computer. What are the components that exist within a computer? We'll be looking at processor. We will we, CPU, which is called the processor, the central processing unit. We'll be looking at it and what is the function of this in computer. We're going to be looking at the RAM, you know, the RAM, this random access memory, um, you know, within the computer system. This class is um, when I mention something in one class, the next class I can I'm going to talk about full it in full. So sometimes just go most times go with the flow, understand what we're saying, so you understand the connection between each one of them. So before we go into the topic for today, I'm going to open the floor for one or two minutes for you to ask any question, any question, if you're unclear, so that we can proceed into the topic for today. The floor is open. You can unmute yourself if you have a question. And when you finish asking a question, please mute yourself back. Any question? Emmanuel, you want to ask a question? No, I'm good for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ola here. Yes, please. You have a question? I, I just wanted to know. Yes. Uh, in, in my company, we always uh, raise tickets on JIRA. Are we talking about the same tickets here? Yes, it's the same thing. We have um, some organization that use JIRA, some organization use ServiceNow, some organization use what we call our ShareWell. So it depends on their different ticketing system, all as um, they follow the same methodology approach, but different designs. Okay, so okay. It, it's the same thing. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other question? Okay, silence is golden. Um, 
there's no questions, so let's move into you know the topic for today. And um, you know, I'll always give you guys 15 minutes break. So when it is um, by 10:30, okay, I'm going to give you a 15 minutes break. Then we continue. So you have um, you relax from whatever information that you've had so far. Okay. So let's move. Okay. When we're talking about um, safety and professionalism, what exactly are we talking about? Okay. You want to really understand what safety and professionalism is all about. Safety and professionalism, there are two things, okay? Safety, like I said, is how you can work within the environment and ensure that you work in a safe condition, okay? What are the things that you need to be able to work effectively and safe within your organization? Now, when it comes to computer, computer carry charges. You can touch a computer, nothing is happening, but your body is also carrying electrostatic charge that can damage a component within a computer system when you open it up, not when it is not open. But when you open it up, we all know that we have some static charge within our body, and when you touch any component, it can get the component damaged. You can damage your computer if you're not well grounded. That's what I mean. So there's always what we call it a static discharge um, that you can use. So we're going to be looking at each of these tools. I'm just trying to explain to you what safety is all about and professionalism there. Professionalism is the courage, you know, how you present yourself, proper appearance, and also a professional manner to be able to talk to customers, okay, and um, to be able to work in a productive manner, you know, at any point in time. That's just what safety and professionalism is all about. But we're going to break it down into what exactly we're looking at, okay? I tell people, when you're talking about um, safety and professionalism, we're looking at what kind of tools of trade do you need to have as an IT person? All trainers will tell you, oh, you need, you know, like you're seeing on my screen, you need the multimeter, you need the tone generator and probes, you need the loop back plug, you need um, a cable tester, you need um, a tambo star, twister, um, scissor, and a sponger, and as many more, you know, set of screwdrivers and everything. But to me, my normal tool of trade is always my mobile phone, USBs and screwdriver, and I will tell you why. Now, as an IT, you are not expected to know the solution to every problem. Because why? Technology changes due to innovation. Invention of new technology you might not be aware of. New problems emanating and spreading that you are not aware of. So when you see a problem, if you have a false information on what that problem is all about, good. You just go there, you solve the problem. But when you don't know the problem, go go the problem. There is no, nobody says that it's, it's wrong for you to go. Everybody, even people in computer for decades of years, you know, they still go into, they go online to check what does this problem mean. Now, the important thing there is how exactly can you interpret what you're seeing and to be able to use it to resolve the problem. Now, people call you, not that they cannot Google it as well and see that, okay, this is the problem, this is how to do it. But they don't know how to do it. That's why they need your technical expertise, you know, to be able to resolve the problem. So to me, my phone is always number one. So I go around, when I see a problem, I don't know the solution to it. I looked at what people have done and I see, is this right or wrong? Can I apply these within my office setting? If yes. Now, when you, can, when you see solutions now, sometimes you know the solution to a problem, but you cannot solve the problem. Some of you might have encountered that kind of problem before. You can solve it, but the organization didn't give you the right to solve it. So meaning that you have to escalate the ticket to someone else that will do it. It's just like in the banking sector. I want to redraw 50,000. A normal cashier, you know, uh, can just pay me out, check my account balance. I have the sufficient amount withdraw the money, stamp it, give me the money, and I go. It is different from when I go to the bank and say, I want to withdraw maybe $100,000 or $200,000, or say $3 million, for example. They need to go to their next boss. It's not that they cannot pay, but they don't have the right to be able to pay such amount of money, meaning that there's a caveat on the level of activities they can do. Someone else has to carry it out. So you need to go to the next person and say, hey, this, 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 I've verified Everything is fine, but I need you to use the authorization so that I can do this. Okay? That is procedures within organizations. And uh, like I said, some of you would have experienced 
stuff like this before. Okay, let's look at each of these tools. Let's see what they do. Okay, and um, when we talk about multimeter, sometimes it is called multimeter, sometimes it is called multi tester, meaning that you use it to check the voltage, you know, in any computer. Now, in this world, nobody uses it, right, in a business environment, because every company always sign agreements with OEMs. And uh, when I mean OEMs, I mean original equipment manufacturer. So if I'm dealing with Dell, for example, I'm buying in bulk as a company. I just tell them that I'm buying this. There's all, it comes with warranty, just the same way with your phone. When it has issues, you call them up, they fix it. It's different from how majority of us started computer back then in year 2000, you know, and uh, for some of that started, you know, in late 2000s, where you have to repair some of these things yourself. You have to check it yourself. But Coptia do still not care that even though there's advancement in operational way at which job is being done, okay? They still want you to know what these tools are for because you will encounter it in your exam. Now, some of the things I'm going to be training you or telling you about, it is not needed at the place of work, but it is required for your exam. So it's going to, so this training is going to be for two things. Number one, to prep you for your exam and also to prep you for the work that you're going to be doing, okay? Now, this multimeter is also known as um, VOM, which is mean volt, ohm, and um, milli uh, millimeter. Okay, it's an electronic device that is used for measuring. For uh, for uh, measuring, I'm talking about um, instruments that comes with several measuring functions in um, one unit. So, meaning that on that same unit, you can watch what is going, what is coming out from a power outlet, or to be yeah, literally from what's coming out from a power outlet. So it can either be directly from the source or from equipment. You just want to see what voltage is it giving you. And the only sense why IT people use it is that when voltage is supposed to be supplied to an equipment, okay, if the voltage drops beyond a, an acceptable level, you will see that that device will be on, but it's not going to work. And I know that some of you would have experienced it in a conditional environment where they say we have low voltage you will understand that maybe your air condition might not be working. You will see that it is on, but it's not giving out the right output. Or maybe you have a car, for example, some of the plugs are not working fine, and you say your car is misfiring, okay? Now, it's just scenarios like that, okay? It's just for you to check if you're getting the right voltage that is expected. That's why you see any adapter that you see today, either for laptop or, you know, your TV itself, they're going to put something at the back of it. They give you the, the, the required amp that is required for that TV or that um, charger to be able to work. They're going to tell you in terms of voltage. That's why you see some people will tell you, is it American voltage when we are, or Canada voltage where you have um, 110, 100 to 120? Sometimes they say 110 to 120. And um, you see some devices, they say um, 200 to 220. That's why you see when you buy devices from say US, for example, and you're taking it to a place like Nigeria, you want to check the voltage because if you don't, if you plug a device that is rated as 110 into an out outlet that gives you 220, then you're going to fry that device. That's why you see people have voltage converters that they put, they attach to a particular device so that the output from the source manage the expected output for that particular device. Okay, that is why voltmeter it's very important. Okay, so that you can be able to measure if it's not listed, and for you to be able to, if you are not certainly sure of the output from the from the outlet, you want to test it to be able to know what output is given out to see if it's suitable for your device or it can damage your device. We have what we call a tone generator and probes. What exactly does this does? Okay, what it do is that it allows you to have um, to test a complete signal tracing is a signal tracing within a particular device so literally what it does is that it will identify and trace wire or cables within a group without damaging the insulator so what i'm saying is that you have an insulator insulator is you know what you see when you have a set of wires and it's been covered you know with um, like um, a copper for example or like in um, i can put like kind of rubber that's in that's used at the outbound pass of a cable now, when you have wires that have the same kind of colors and you want to check each of the points to be sure of the exact cable, without opening the insulator, I mean the cover, you can just put it at the mouth of the wire and the other end, and you can able to know which wire is which so you don't plug 
you don't wrongly connect those wires, you know, for example. And um, example of this is, um, say you have um, a kind of, um, um, from the outlet, where you have your, your red, you have your black, and sometimes green, you know, or red, black, and, and um, gray, which serves as neutral. Now, sometimes if it has the same color, you just want to be sure that the wire that you have, the end wire that you have at the other end is the same termination you're doing at this end. So you don't go and plug it. So that's called loop if you wrongly do it. And when you do it, it's going to send a voltage back and it's going to damage the equipment. Now, apart from damaging the equipment, there can be a spike and you can damage anything, you know, because the voltage is going to loop together. There's going to be a spark and anything can happen. So this can allow you to trace any wire without damaging the insulation, you know, that comes with that particular wire. Then you have what we call a loopback plug, okay? Now, what a loopback plug does is it's used for diagnosing transmission problem. And what am I saying? You have devices normally that are supposed to be within a network, and you know the whole essence of a network is a network coming to okay, let me put it like the network coming to existence where two or more computers can communicate and share resources. That's where you have a network. And you want to be able to confirm when there's a problem, when a particular computer cannot communicate within the network, having checking everything. So you want to plug the loopback plug, which has what we call an RJ45 connector. You're going to see it as we go in the class and you see the exact meaning of what it does. You want to plug into your network port, okay, to be able to see if there's a transmission problem or not. Now, this cable is usually plugged into what we call an Ethernet, okay, or a serial port. And it crosses over transmission line to the receiving line so that outgoing signals can be redirected back into the computer. So what I'm saying is that there are two computers. I want to be able to talk to another computer, right? When I send a signal, there's going to be a receiving. So we have send and receive. Without plugging another computer, I want to see if my computer can be able to communicate with another computer. And I want to see if that other computer wants to communicate with me. Is my computer fit enough? Is my computer good enough? It's my connectivity. No, it's my device that will allow that connectivity to come into existence working as expected. So this Luba plug will allow you to be able to test the transmission within a single port. There is no other computer, but you'll be able to know with this Luba plug if communication can exist through your network port. We have what we call a cable tester. And what does cable tester do? And this goes for a lot of people that do a lot of cabling or networking. Sometimes organizations want to set up a new office. There's no device there. They just say, okay, as a computer person, as a network person, or as a cable, uh, you know, deployer person, I want to, I want to have um, a network design for my office. I want to have four network ports within my second, within my reception, maybe five office, five network ports start in, um, say, in office A, 10 network ports start in network B. You know that your job is to lay these cables. There's no device to test with it. But you want to do it in such a way that by the time you lay this cable, you want to test it. If, if they bring any device to that spot and they plug it, that is going to work. So when you do all your terminations in terms of laying cables, you now put a wire in it. You pull one mouth to one of the one of the connect. You see that there's a space in between. It means that you can detach it. You plug the cable to one. You plug cable to the other one, and you power it on. Now it's going to go from one, two, three to eight in terms of line. So it will be happening on those two together. It will tell you one year. It tells you one year. Tell you two year. Tell you two year. What it's telling is that. On each of the wires, because in a network cable, you have a situation where we have four pairs, which is eight wires, or you have two pairs, which is four wires. Now, the eight pairs is used for connecting computers. The two pairs is used for telephoning system, where, you know, you just want to send and receive calls. So same cable kind of can be used, you know, at that point. So when one and one shows, it means that the cable that serves as number one at this node is the cable at this node are working correctly. So one, one will come up. 2-2 two, two will come up, 3-3 three, three will come up. Any line that is not coming up, meaning that that line is not working. So you need to cut the wire and you have to do it again. Okay? By the time you finish and you test it, you can rest assured, go back to the organization and say, I have fully networked your office and everything is working fine because I have done user acceptance tests to test that it is working as expected. You'll be able to do this. My pattern of training is 
I want you to have, have an appreciation of your new career. Then we'll go into practical. So understand what each one of them does first. Just the same way when you go to universities, they give you theory in year one, year two, and probably year three, and the final year you still be doing theory, but it's different. So your first two, three class is going to be more of you understanding the computer world. So by the time we're going into practicals, when I say anything, you understand what I'm saying. And when somebody mentions any item, you know what that person is saying, okay? Let's proceed. We have what we call hemostats. You see that hemostat for people in the medical line, you will see that sometimes it is used doing um, operation for holding either to close um, veins or tissues or just to stop blockage of, you know, of, uh, or, or blockage of fluid, either water or, or what's it called, or blood, right? It is also used in computer. And what is used for in computing is that when you have a cable, you can use it to bend a wire. So rather than you using your hand and you damage yourself, you can just use the hemostat to, you know, to bend the wire as you want it and do whatever it is that you want to do with it. You have what we call the, the teaser. So literally what that does is, you know, I told you, I say, your body by default carry a static charge. And when you put a beer and on component, you can damage it. And sometimes you might be working in um, a desktop environment. When I mean desktop, I know some of you know a desktop computer and it's open. Probably you're unscrewing a screw and the screw fell somewhere. You can't be putting your hand inside because you can damage something. So you can use this to be able to pick screws or pick something that falls inside your computer instead of you putting your beer ends. We have what we call the sponger. Now, what this is used for many things. Number one, when you want to open your laptop, you see that nowadays laptops they do now come with screws. When you remove those, when you unscrew it, it will still open. Uh, same thing happens to your phone as well. If you remove the screw, by default, your phone will not open. So you need something like a sponger to be able to put at one edge and you know press it or just tweak it to the other side so that it can move, it can uh, be disjointed, you know, from the other part. So it opens. So by the time you finish, you close it back, and you see you will feel that sound when you're closing it, that there's a clip inside that is holding. So it is the app of this sponger that you can use to open it when you want to open. Same thing happens to wristwatch as well. When you open, you see that some scientists are not opening, and you need something to put inside and just bend a little bit to be able to remove it from the lock that it's inside. So that's what it is used for. You have what we call the, the pre bag. It's also the same thing as, uh, you know, the sponger. But this one comes in iron. And you see this one more in, uh, you know, these factories and probably mechanics and all. But it uses in computer as well. When you're dealing with, you know, large machines and you need to open something. So you can just, when you remove the screw, you put it by the side. Same thing, it does the same thing. Some, one thing that is not here is screwdriver. Okay? And you use that to be able to, you know, um, to open your computer do whatever you want to do, screw and unscrew anything. So you have what we call um, with prescriptions, um, screwdrivers or different kind of screwdrivers that you can see. Okay, so that is um, for um, I, um, tools of trade that is required for you to be able to work. Now, I told you guys that there is what we call operational procedures. Okay, um, you have it on your screen, but I'm going to explain to you so you have a better appreciation. Like I said, I do slides just because I want you to revise. Most times, just listen to me and don't miss the class. Now, when there is a problem, and for some of you, I know um, Dapo was, asked, was making me ask something about Jira the other time, okay? And um, I will want to believe that what we're going to be seeing now, or what you're seeing on screen, is partly what you do, you know, at place of work when you're using ticketing. Now, Users, most times, and get comfortable with this, there's what we call the word empathy in any um, level one. That's FDEX. Meaning that when you're dealing with anyone, you deal with angry people. And you need to be able to manage them. And they ask this thing in interview questions. They want to see how exactly you can manage angry customers. The key word that you always use is empathy. Meaning that you put yourself in a position of that customer. A customer, like I said, can either be an internal staff or someone, an external person. So you want to put yourself in their shoes to make them understand how you would have feel, you know, if you're in that position. That alone can customers down. And many organizations will always ask you about this when it comes to customer relations. 
you know, how exactly do you manage people? So they always want you to use that word empathy, you know, that one of your skills is empathy. You try to as much as possible to put that customer, you put yourself in that customer's shoes and to be able to calm them down and promise them that things are going to be done, that you're going to try your best, even though you know that sometimes there's no solution for it. It means that you can manage the situation, you know, without causing chaos. Now, going back to what I'm saying in, in terms of identifying a problem, you see, customers will call you. When I, I, I've already explained that, customer will call you and say, I have a problem with my computer. My mouse is no longer working, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Now, you've been in level one, you create that ticket and say, okay, um, Sam is calling. After you've gathered my name, he says keyboard mouse is not working. That is not just the problem because customers only tell you the challenge they see, not the real problem that is happening. So it is now left for you to be able to ask them some certain questions. Now, the whole essence of these questions is, if you yourself cannot solve that problem, the next person that is going to solve that problem can read the conversation that transpired between the caller and the colleague to be able to see this is what the escalation, this is what the problem is. So you look at it, sometimes when you read all the symptoms, you realize that it does not tally with the subject, okay? So that's why you gather as much details as possible for people that will work on the ticket. And if you are the one that will work on the ticket, a customer has already laid a complaint. This is what the problem is. But you also want to be able to know if truly that is the problem. So you need to be able to ask them, you know, the users the right questions, okay? You want to identify if there has been a recent change. Because before I can say there's a problem, it means that that thing has been operational before the incident. So you want to know if anything has changed from the last time it was working fine to when it has not it stopped working. Have you installed anything? Has there been anything installed on your computer? Or did you make a change you know, to any settings? You're just asking them mere questions for you to understand it. Sometimes customers don't want to hear. They're like, I said this thing is not working, blah, blah, blah. That's why you have to put yourself in their position. That is what, where the empathy comes into existence, where you put you to make them understand you know, how they're feeling, even though you cannot have in detail how they feel, but you make them feel comfortable that this person is trying to listen and solve the problem. Then you can now ask them questions. So what I'm saying, you know, in a sense, is that when you start working, you cannot just ask questions because you think that you need that question to create that ticket. The first thing is you need to be able to understand angry customers and customers that are not angry. You deal with them separately, okay? And that's where the word empathy that I used the other time come into existence. It's part of the skills which you need to have. When you go to university and learn computer science, then nobody tells you that, that empathy X, Y, Z. They just teach you basic COBOL, Pascal, Fortran, you know, C Sharp and all what have you that you don't need at the place of work. So anything I'm telling you, it's what is required. These are skills that is expected for you to get a good job in Canada, in anywhere in the world, okay? The first, th another thing you want to look at when it comes to identifying problems is, like I mentioned, if there's been a change to our existing infrastructure, Sometimes it might, not, the, it might not be at the customer level. It might be at the L2, L3 level. You want to know as well if there are changes that has been done. Then the major tools any IT should use when troubleshooting is when you're reviewing logs. It is only a log that will tell you when there is a problem or no problem with a computer system. And it's the one that will tell you what changes that might have occurred that might cause that issue. It is the only thing that can tell you where exactly the problem is existing. Okay, those are the number one skill. When somebody asks you, tell us the basic troubleshooting question. The first thing you fail to say is identifying the root cause of a problem or identifying a problem. And they can tell you to break it down. You just tell them that part of what you do, apart from the fact that there's an escalation, is for you to have a detailed understanding of what the problem is all about. It's just like when you are writing your project and they give you a topic and you have to write what we call a problem, st um, a problem statement, if I'm correct, where you, you summarize you know, what you think might be the problem. So at that point, you are gathering information that will help you to be able to provide a profound solution. Now, when you understand the problem, the next thing you want to do is for you to be able to establish within you what might be the cause of this problem. Okay, now this is a situation whereby you have to identify different things, then you have to check the internet if you are not aware of it, then you have to apply it. 
Sometimes you go online, the solution they put there might not be the solution that you apply to your own problem. The internet is just for you to understand. So you need to be able to know what and what you can practice. It is not everything they put on the computer, on the internet that you can use. And the reason why I say that is this. Internet has nothing. Anything you are browsing is not just in the cloud. It's on somebody's computer. When you go anything, it goes into different hosting to see where those words, which is called meta tag, exist and pull the information from you. So when anybody asks you, there's nothing on the internet, okay? The internet is just a means at which you can connect to a remote system to get information out. So not everything anybody posts that you can use at the place of work. So you need to apply your two cents and check, is this solution applicable or not applicable, or what they're saying, does it tally with what you're trying to do? Then you test different things. You test the theory, your assumption, to see if that will solve the problem, okay? Now, you need now to establish a plan. Okay, if this will solve my problem, how do I plan it? Number one, you might always think of, okay, let me back up this computer. When you back up the computer, it means that you are saving the state of that computer. Just in case anything goes wrong, you can return back to how it was before you do anything. So you want to come up with a plan that this and this is what I want to do. Okay, this is when I'm going to solve the problem. Another thing, again, is that if you don't come up with a plan, what you're doing, if it doesn't work, and there's no plan, or you are not articulating what you're doing, you might not be able to roll back your configuration. Then you make the case worsen. So you need to document any changes you're doing so that if it doesn't work, you refer back to the old, what is there before, then you can try another step until you're able to establish a workable plan or identify the right solution. Okay? Now, when this is done, you, that's why you see, what I'm saying now is that you see some people, they want to solve your problem, they will solve it and cause more problems. Why am I saying that? Why I'm saying that is that when they solve, when you are solving a problem, okay, you solve the problem. You want to check if your solution has not caused another damage. That's why you see for cars sometimes, you take your car to the mechanic, they solve one problem, you get back home, another problem is starting. What happened? They solve the actual problem that you want, you went there to do. But in the process of solving that problem, they cause another damage. Probably they cause a wire mistake in it. Probably they lose something they forget to to tie. Some maybe in the medical line, somebody is working on intestine and or probably um, um, CS. And by the time they finish, they forget um, a um, they forget um, a tool, you know, inside the person. Okay, and they seal it up. And let's say I'm feeling the pain. They open up the person and they realize that they forgot one of their tools inside that person. It's because they didn't do they didn't verify that everything is fine before closing up that person. Same thing with computer. There's a problem. You solve the problem. When you solve the problem, you want to check in totality the functionalities within that computer if everything is working fine. Then you can answer the user and say, test the problem. Test if the problem is resolved and check that everything is fine. When everything is done correctly, the next thing you want to do is to explain to the user. Now, when I say explain, don't ever, listen, don't ever tell customers technical jargons. You just want to tell them this was the problem, this was what you did. It, sometimes you correct what they've done. Probably they're the one that made a mistake. You just say, oh, you realize that they make XYZ changes. Anytime you see this happening, try this. Now, you're not telling them the technical aspect because when you tell them the technical or what you've done, you're depriving yourself from work because if there's no problem, you cannot, you cannot sell and you cannot solve. Nobody pays your bills. You are working so that you can provide solutions. So you only tell them mere things and not the technical things for them to understand so that you can remain relevant within the place of work, okay? And um, the last thing in your troubleshooting steps is when you resolve a problem, you have to document your problem. You cannot do work on a problem now and you don't document it. This is where you'll be hearing organizations talking about knowledge base. And when you go for interviews, they also want to be hearing when they say, oh, when you do, how do you, what, what are the processes you take when you're resolving a problem? After you say everything about the steps, you have to tell them that you document every steps you're working on. That step means you are saying that you receive a call that there's a problem with XYZ. Doing your findings, this and this is what you discovered. This is what you apply to resolve the problem. Okay? That's documentation. Documentation is not just for the purpose of I solve a problem, I'm writing documentation. Documentation is for it to help other people that might see similar problems. 
That's why you see for people working at the call center, sometimes when there's a problem, rather than them understanding the escalation, they go straight into KBs and try looking for similar thing and tell you do this. Most times it doesn't solve the problem. But the good part is that when it is there, people that have the right skills can read that documentation and say, okay, this is what is applicable that I can apply to this customer because it's solved. If I don't need to Google the internet, I don't need to ask anyone they've documented. So you see similar problems that is documented and you can go through it. It's just like lawyers. When you go to the court and you want to fight, you want to win a case, you have to make references if there's any to similar cases that has been done before, right, to solve the problem. That aspect of that document is what we call a knowledge base. You document your findings, action, and the output of all that needs to be done, okay? And um, now it's going to come to question, but before we go into questioning, there are some certain things as well that I want you to understand before the break. So when we come back from the 15 minutes break, we're going to answer the questions. But I want you guys to understand some certain things again that is needed or things that needs to be known. Number one, there is what we call authorization of work form. When you go to any company or your working organization, you need to make a change. It is always good you document what you want to do and you get the right approval. Like I said, sometimes you know it, but you need an approval before you can do it. And the reason is that you, there are some times you cannot make change during operational hours. There are some times you need to make people or your boss to understand what changes you want to do so that he or she can comment to tell you if it's the right approach or not the right approach. And you need to be able to do document it. And part of the things, again, when it comes to authorization to work, is for you to, you'll be documenting a lot of things, especially when you're working as a contractor. You want to have your company name, the billing information, date, and the scope of work. Scope of work means what you want to do. Most computer repair companies require you to fill you know, this kind of form in order to protect you against litigations, okay? So that you don't do something out of, that you're not expected to, that might cause serious litigation and you have to pay severely for it. I make mention to you the other time, sometimes some people use the word empathy. Some people use the word sensitivity. And this is the um, ability, you know, to appreciate another person's feeling and emotion. That's why I said, when you're solving problems, there are two types of people you have to deal, you'll be looking at. Angry customers and um, people that are not. So approach to them is different. So you need to be sensitive enough to understand their feeling and you respect it with their emotion, okay? I make mention of some certain words when I was talking the other time and um, some of them have to do it. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it though, but some of them have to do with uh, electromag electromagnetic pulse, okay? Electromagnetic pulse, sometimes you see that's an acronym, they write EMP, okay, which means electromagnetic pulse. The E there is electro, the M is magnetic, and the P is um, pulse. Um, it's averagely damaged electronic equipment, okay? This EMP damage equipment, know that it's an electromagnetic pulse, and it can damage equipment or devices. I make mention of what we call electrostatic discharge. It means passage of static electric charge from one item to the other, or from your own body to an item, a computer component. And this can destroy sensitive parts of any computer. And, it's a, and you have to ensure that you avoid this when you're working. You, might, you, might, you don't want to go to solve a $50 job and cause $500 problem due to negligence, okay? Due to the fact that you're not protecting yourself. That's when I'm talking about safety the other time. There's what we call EMI electromagnetic interference, okay? And this has to do with when you have, for those people that did sciences back in school, you'll be talking about a magnetic field that interfere with electronics, something like you putting like a magnet in front of your monitor, you know, something like that, okay? And, you know, um, despite not feeling any dangerous as an uh, electrostatic discharge, you can say it's simply capable of causing permanent damage to a particular component or erasing data from a storage. Now, what am I saying? If you carry a magnet and you put it on a uh, on hard disk, for example, it can clean everything that is there, or a memory, it can discharge it completely. And they're going to lose everything due to negligence because you, you didn't know why packing and you packed everything up together and it caused serious damage. I make mention of what we call anti-static risk trap. You know, I said when you have electro, electric static um, discharge, uh, electrostatic in your body, you can use a wrist trap. It is called anti 
and the static strap, you know, where you can put on your hand and you ground it to a melter or to something, okay, whereby it will discharge, you know, any electric uh, electric component, any electric, any static charge on your body, okay? And um, when you open up a computer, there is also one thing again. You just don't want to open a computer and put those components on, say, on, um, on a melter or just anywhere. There's always what we call, um, there's always what we call anti-static mat. Okay, um, anti-static mat is just a mat that when you put a component, it will discharge anything, any, 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 anything on that device, whereby it will not damage it. Okay, that is um, what that is for. And there's one other thing again, which is called RFI. RFI means radio frequency interference. And um, you know, when we're talking about this, we're talking about a radio emitting devices, you know, that interfere with more sensitive devices like speakers, like phones. Okay. Um, Why not damaging it's quite um, irritating. It can become a, da a big problem when two or more devices of same frequency are within the same vicinity as each other and we constantly stomp out, you know, or cause a, a disruption in signal. So you need to be aware of um, these um, things I've already mentioned. Um, which is very good when we're talking about safety, okay? Um, now, uh, I think that we're going to do it after we go on break, but since we still have five minutes before the break, there are some questions that are here. Um, all of you, if you know that your hands is up, drop the hand, and um, one after the other, we, I'm just going to pick names and just ask you for questions. Just tell me. It's not, you know, we're just learning, okay? And um, you, can, um, you can be able to just see how you're going well with all that I've been talking about. Um, all that part, this question is for you because I see that your hand is still up, so you're going to lead the way, okay? Look at the screen. Can you tell me the, question, the answer to number one? Which device is not likely to be found in a technician toolbox? All that part, uh, you raise your EMP. Yeah. Sorry? EMP. EMP. See, I'm not disappointed. I have the best people in this class. Okay, I see that Yinka decided to raise his hand, so you're going to do the number two question. A, techni a, a, a tech might use a voltmeter or this tool to check power coming out of a wall, uh, um, a wall socket. What's the answer, Inga? Inga, are you there? Okay, uh, this one I'm not so sure about. I'm thinking uh, voltmeter. Okay, um, the answer is correct. That, um, that's what you use. It's either, called a, it's either called a voltmeter or it's called um, a VOM, right? Um, there's nothing, there's a, yeah, so, uh, um, what's it called? RFI, mute, can you mute? Once you talk, just mute, so that noise doesn't come in. When you talk about RFI meter, or you talk about um, ESD meter, he does not test the wall, um, he does not test the wall power, so you're correct, and we all know what um, a teaser is all about, okay? Thank you for that. Okay, anybody that is bold enough? Um, I see Shane raised the hand, so Shane, you're going to answer the next question. Uh, so can you can you read? Uh, can you tell us the answer, Shane, for the next? Uh, your video out, Emmanuel, off your video. Okay, um, Shane, can you tell us this? The first step in troubleshooting is what? How do you troubleshoot the question? Uh, the answer to that question is here: finding out the root cause, identify the problem, and all. I have a question. I don't know whether I can lump everything together or just no, start that. No, nope, no, nope, don't lump it up together. You're going to ask your question. Oh, the question. Okay. Oh, the tight. Okay. Then um, I can see that um, we did hand this up. Can you tell? Okay. Um, can you tell us the? This is the question. Sorry, I made a mistake here. The question is after a problem is, is solved, which is an appropriate step. So the quest, the answer starts from replace. That's B to E. Okay. Forget about the A. So, Mujid, can you tell us the answer to this? After a problem is solved, which is an appropriate step? Yeah, after the problem is solved, then you have to take uh, preventive measures. Can you hear me?
Hello? Yeah, sorry, it's from um, it's from here. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I say after the problem is solved, they have to take preventive measures. Thank you. Thank you. I'm proud of you guys. <laughs> Okay, that's the end of the question for the first one. So if you know you've not answered any question, by the time we come back from break, you're going to answer the question. No, you're going to answer the next set of questions after we attend to the visible computer. Okay, so now I'm going to I will allow. Um, you see, Shem was the one that wanted to ask a question, right? Yes, yes. Okay, Shem, can you ask your question, please? Okay, yeah, I. I so much appreciate this course. I there are some things that are related to what I've done before and what I'm even doing presently in my place. Well, I just okay. want to ask: uh, Are there any uh, PPE that uh, a technical person needs to wear, like personal protective equipment that are required? And if there, are, if you have them, can you please add, uh, maybe itemize them so that we can have uh, what they look like and know? Thank you. Yeah, sure. That's my question. Sure. Okay, um, to answer that, it depends on the kind of work you're doing. If you're, if you're not a field worker, meaning that you're not working on, say, um, maybe on a mask or something that will require an item to fall on you, you don't need helmets. You can't be wearing helmets at the place of work. Only when you have um, things around and um, where you can get at is probably you go to a data center and things are high up and anything can fall down, you want to use it. But most times you might want to go in with a kind of a glove so that if you have any charges on you, it's being prevented. And um, no PPE literally in um, IT when you're working. OK, no, nothing special. But when it comes to a little bit of item, I'm going to send it to you guys as well um, that you might need depending on the kind of your job. But majority of what I'm training you guys to do, you won't be needing all those PPEs. I'm not training you to be a feed worker and be earning less than $20 or within less than $30. I'm training you to earn more than, more than $30, okay? So, but I'm still going to make it available just in case you have an understanding or appreciation of the kind of PPE that you might need as an IT person. Does that answer your question, Shem? Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. So now we're going to go on break. Then we're going to, we're going to come back. Um, we're going to come back in uh, 15 minutes. Um, it's going to be 13 minutes, sorry. I, we go two minutes into your time. So let's be back by 10.45, please. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording now, then I'm going to continue recording by the time we come back. 